Welcome. My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Caroline, John, and Brooke today, and we're talking about La Cucina Italiana, more specifically, the cooking of Rome, capital of all of Christianity, capital of Italy, capital of the Roman Empire, a magnificent place where great and simple food is all based on the seasons and the kind of things that you get there. Today, we're going to make three delicious dishes. The show's called Bocce is Not Just a Game because we're going to make bocette little balls of meat that are going to float in a broth and become something that are totally different than any meatballs you ever expected because they're so simple and perfect. We're also going to make a timbalo di riso, a turban of rice, as well as another kind of a meatball made out of some fish. First thing up, though, we're going to make a little bit of beef broth. Now, the whole concept of stock in the French kitchen is something that involves massive amounts of technical wizardry and all these guys with big long hats and huge knives. In, in Italy, however, it's much less so. You just take a whole mess of water, you take many less bones than they need. When you're making a giant gloss de viande in the French kitchen, you take the, the bones of nine or ten animals, you brown them heavily in a big pot and pan, and then you put them in here. In Italy, we just take three marrow bones and we save them, we toss them in. We take an onion, we don't chop it into a mirepoix, we don't make it into anything that isn't, we cut it in half. The carrots and celery are cut in half. And there you have it, right? That's our magnificent beef broth. If we're feeling risky, two cloves of garlic go in. And what you want to do is you want to bring that whole thing up to a boil, <clears throat> cook it for 35 to 45 minutes, skim off the very first foam, then lower the heat and simmer it for about two hours, in which case then you remove those bones. We set the bones aside because inside those beautiful bones, those shank bones, is the marrow. What is marrow, Mario? Marrow is the stuff that transforms white blood cells into things that we can use. People have bone marrow transplants because it's gone wrong. It's a really risky and difficult thing, but it's really delicious out of a cow. I've never had human marrow yet, <laughs> but it's a really good thing, and what it creates is a certain amount of gelatinousness to the broth itself. Oh. So now you've got your broth going. What we've done here is created that same broth, reduced it. Had we taken about the six, three quarts of water that we started with here, it would have given us about a quart of good broth here. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make meatballs. The key to that is understanding that in the wealthy modern times, we think that the more meat, the better in a meatball. Well, in fact, that's completely felonious. Not bad, huh? The whole reason why meatballs tasted so good in the first time is because they were actually stretching them out because they didn't have enough meat to make it go around. So they'd use all this extra bread, which was left over from the day or the week before. They would grind that up and mix it in. Well, as it turns out, if you make meatballs just out of meat itself, they're too firm because it's all protein. There's nothing there to soften it up. So all we're going to do to make meatballs is take about equal portions, ground veal, and you could use ground turkey, ground chicken, ground pork, and a little bit of pecorino romano. And we're going to mix that together with a nice handful of parsley and just mix it until the whole thing comes together. Now, in many cases with breadcrumbs, you want to be careful not to overmix because you want them to still retain their kind of airiness. And that's exactly the same thing here with the meat. If you came here and mixed it and mixed it and mixed it for 15 minutes, you'd have something that became a little bit too kind of gummy and, and not appetizing for that matter. What you want to do is just mix it until the breadcrumbs and the meat have become more or less together without really trying to change the texture of the meat. Then what you're going to do is you're going to make little balls and that's exactly what you guys are going to do. You're going to take them like so and you're going to form them just like that. Mario, yes. I've seen you uh, make sausages on the show and you usually add a fat to it. Would you ever add a fat to a meatball? Well, no. Because the reason that you're adding fat to the sausages is because you're taking a lean piece of meat and then deciding to make something into it. Like you'll take the, the shoulder butt or a uh, piece of the back leg. You want to make sure that you mix enough fat in there so that when you cook it, it's juicy. But in this case, we're actually going to poach these. And this is ground meat that is coming from the shoulder, which has also the parts that have the little fat and the connective tissue. So go ahead and form them and then just drop them right up here on the board. The next thing we're going to do is make little meatballs or croquette of bacala. And again, we're using bread. We're going to take a little bit of walnut liqueur called nocino or nocello, and we're just going to soak this bread so that it breaks down and becomes softer. Then we're going to take bacala, perhaps the most Roman of fishes. And what we've done is we've soaked this bacala. It's salt cod. They call it bacala or stoccafiso in Italy. Stoccafiso refers to salt cod that hasn't been salted. It's just been dried. Bacala has been salted and allowed to dry. So stoccafiso they use a lot more in Venice. But in Rome, it's all bacala. 
Why, how would you dry it without salting it? Like, you just you take it, it out there in the tundra up there in Norway and just you cut the scary. fillets off where the air is really, really cold and it just dries out in the own wind. Huh. But salt is for preserving it for even longer. You, so you need to soak the stuff for two days. When you go to the fish markets in Rome or anywhere in Italy for that matter, you'll find that they'll sell it, particularly during the holidays, the, the holidays preceding Christmas, which is where fish is really, really important. They'll sell it pre-soaked. But when we buy it, you have to soak it. So you soak it for two days, you change the water a lot, and what you want to do is just break the stuff up. At this point, it's been salted and then reconstituted. So you could actually eat it just like this. And in a lot of restaurants, you'll see they make salads out of this bacala just like this without having done anything to it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take some capers. We're going to take some olives. We're going to take three eggs. We're going to take a little bit of marjoram. How the meatballs work out, guys? Good? You happy about them? Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. We're going to take a little bit of marjoram. We're just going to tear it up a little bit. And then I'm going to take this bread and I'm going to tear it into tiny little pieces. When we come back, I'll have brought this whole thing together. I'll show you how we're going to fry it and we'll get the meatballs in the broth. Actually, I'm going to throw the meatballs in the broth right now. Welcome back. Let's start a little snacky snackerton here with our beautiful little bochette. Now these have poached. You'll notice there's an entirely different texture. There's a whole different feel, a whole different world going on here because in this little light broth, meatballs are an entirely different game. There's no caramelization. They're slightly, slightly pink at the very center. These are exactly what you want. You're sitting there, it's, it's the autumn. You've got bochette. All is right. My Hail own. Caesar. Yes? I grew up with meatballs, but obviously beef meatballs. But in Italian food, it's always veal. Is there a reason? Like, do they eat more veal than they eat beef? Because you don't see a lot of beef in general anyway. Um, well, in Rome, which is the kind of world-class place where all of the... Uh, slaughterhouses were, they saved the best cuts for them. They thought that the veal was much more tender. They thought it was much more succulent. So it's actually a question of them perceiving luxury. Right. But Amer Americans are much more into beef. We're big into our cattle. We're big into the whole world like that. Now, I've got my meatballs here. Of, actually, they're not meatballs anymore. These are bacala. And we want to mix them up really, really well so that they set up nice when we uh, wash your hands after you're done cooking. When we're going to cook them. Now, of course, we're going to cook them in what? We're going to cook them in the lipid of choice. Myra. That is to say, yes. I'm sorry. You're about to use garlic? Is... I'm about to use garlic, yes. Is it used as much as American slink in Italian cooking? Very good question. And as a matter of fact, it's not. Well, in southern Italian cooking, there's a lot more garlic, there's a lot more chilies, there's a lot more aggressive flavors. In northern Italian cooking, there's almost none of that, for that matter. It's a very interesting thing and a little bit different than we think. But the big handfuls of garlic, and as a matter of fact, the whole concept of having more is better is almost an American concept because we were, we're a more wealthy nation. But in fact, in a real Italian cooking, it's much more about balance than it is about aggressive amounts of any one thing. So it's important that if you're using garlic in real Italian cooking, that it tastes just a little of garlic, but that the main event, or whatever you're trying to accentuate, is the most important thing. Now, in a plate of spaghetti with aglio, olio, and peperoncino, which is just garlic, olive oil, and chilies, that's an entirely different thing. And of course, you're gonna have a little bit of garlic. But it's never gonna be these big old handfuls of aggressive stuff. Now, what I'm doing here with the bacala meatballs as I'm dropping them in here and we're going to cook them until they're pretty deep dark golden brown. They're going to hold together because they've got that egg in them but they may even have a tendency to be just a little bit loose and that's all right because we want them to really represent all of the ingredients but most importantly the bacala. And we're just going to flip them and if they start to fall apart don't worry about it. The little pieces are going to flick out and the whole thing's going to come together in the sauce. Now the next thing we're going to make is some beautiful a little timbalo or a, a timbal or a turban of rice. And we're going to cook it in kind of a cool sauce. The first thing we're going to do is start the main ragu for this stuff, which is with some pancetta, some sausage, and some chicken livers. And I'm going to start that in the back pan over here with, again, a little bit more extra virgin olive oil, but not too much because we're going to sweat some of that out in the pork. We're going to take some 
sausages, and these are just regular pork sausages. You recommend mild or sweet? I guess that's the way. These are American. called sweet, but when the, the, the confusion in America is whether sweet's really sweet. Sweet just means not hot in American language, but you wouldn't buy them. In Italy, they wouldn't be hot. There wouldn't be any hot sausages unless it was very specifically noted. The whole concept of sweet and hot, they just don't understand that in Italy. What they will understand is Tuscan versus non-Tuscan, and the Tuscan sausages tend to have fennel in them, and the non-Tuscan ones don't have fennel seeds in them. I like fennel seeds, so you can use fennel seeds in just about anything, and I don't have an issue with it. Come now on. our meatballs, yes? Come on, man. This is delicious. By Thank the way. you. Um, but I noticed your your pan has been on high for a long time. Is it, do you ever <laughs> do you ever get the pan too hot? I mean, is, is for that home possible? cooking, you can. The trick with one of the tricks of TV cookery. I like to have hot pans on because if you just put something in there and it's just, it's not evident that anything's being cooked. So I use hotter pans, and I, although I tend to use pretty hot pans at home because I, I like to develop that crust and that caramelization. That's just a strategy issue though. A lot of people like to have things a little bit lighter and they brown things more delicately and that's just a different taste. Now in this pan I have, I'm only gonna season the chicken liver, but in this pan here I have the pancetta, and you could just as easily use bacon. I have sausage, and I have chicken livers that I've just lightly seasoned. In this back pan over here, I'm gonna start to toast some rice. Now we're using arborio rice, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna toast it and then add a little stock and almost create a risotto, but not with any flavoring at all. So I'm gonna toss that around, and what you wanna do is just toast that until it turns kind of opaque. In the same way that if you were making a risotto, you'd start with your sofrito, you'd saute your onions and whatever it was with it that was in it, and allow that to just kind of cook along for a little bit before you started to add your broth. I'm just going to add water to that so that it doesn't make a big difference. Is uh, Mario's arborio rice native to Rome, or is it? Arborio rice is all over Italy, but mostly in the north. The rice that we're going to use in Roman cooking would have been imported down, because Rome's really, the granary of Rome is actually corn. It's not really a got anything to do with rice but they certainly used a lot of rice but it's not because it was local they had the Roman Empire being the kings of the world just kind of took over the whole thing now to that oil that I just cooked our bacala meatballs in I'm gonna add some garlic some olives some capers and some crushed tomatoes to which I immediately add just a little bit of salt we're gonna bring that whole thing up to a boil when it cools down a little bit we're gonna re-add our bacala meatballs and we're gonna simmer them in that and you're gonna see how delicious that goes so when we come back I'll show you how to finish up the bacala meatballs we'll talk a little bit about our rice which I'm gonna add water to right now and we'll get down with our timbalo lirizo stay with us Welcome back. Now to this beautiful pile of pork, the sausage, and the pancetta. I've added a little bit of crushed tomatoes and I'm gonna add a secret ingredient, dried porcini mushrooms, which are one of my favorite things. Yes. Why would you use dried instead of fresh? Fresh porcini are available about a month at a time, twice a year. They have a great flavor, but they're not always around. What happens when you dry them, however, they become something entirely different, a lot more fragrant and almost meat-like in their intensity and their flavor. So what we'll do is we'll use dried porcini year-round and we'll use fresh porcini and we'll just grill them or saute them, but we wouldn't really put them in a ragu. Now, with my bacala meatballs, we've got a very hot spoon. We'll take them like this and we're gonna arrange them right on the platter, just like so. They've stayed together magnificently. They've cooked in the sauce, and this might easily be a dish that you would see in a little, like, wine bar in Rome, sitting around at room temperature, quite honestly, just about time for lunch. And you'd come by and you'd just order a couple of these and have a little snack with a glass of wine, and that would be all you'd need. What they do, of course, is take a little bit of the herb inside, that is to say this beautiful fresh marjoram, and just drizzle it over the top, like so. Then they'd hand it to someone like Caroline, who will serve it up for the team. Sure. Here's some uh, fancy Roman tongs. <laughs> the 
clean ones are always better. Thank you. Now, our rice is cooked. We've turned it off. We've allowed it to cool. To cool it more quickly, we put it on a sheet pan or a cookie tray, just like this. We allow it to cool completely. We season it with a little bit of salt. And then we take a couple of eggs. Now, at this point, this is all the way cooked through. This is not al dente like we like our risotto. It's completely cooked so that it's relatively soft. We're going to even cook it again because now the timbalo starts to come together. Now, you could do this like the big night and put it in a bowl and do the layers and stuff like that, but I think it makes a little bit more elegant presentation by doing it in one of these cheesecake pans from here in America, also known as springform pans. The key to making that work, bon appetito, guys, give it a taste, Thank you. Thank you. is Smell. making sure that you oil and crumb the entire thing. That is to say, put about a tablespoon of oil in there and then just spin it out. A little extra oil would go in there because waste not, want not. We're not going to do that. We're going to take the breadcrumbs. To make fresh breadcrumbs, you just take fresh bread, you toss it in the food processor, or you chop it up by hand, and you just pass it around. We don't want it to be toasted. If you wanted them to be white, you'd remove the crust, of course, but we're so not those, that obsessed with white. Yes, Caroline? Those are not even dried breadcrumbs. Fresh, fresh. fresh crumbs, and that's what we like about it. So now I'm going to take this well-mixed rice, and we're just going to layer it in. Now, if you wanted to get fancy or Martha Stewart-like, you could maybe make a really tall one and have three or four different layers, right? You could have the layer of rice separated. It's almost like a lasagna at a certain point. You could start to stack in different layers. We could have cooked the chicken liver separately from the sausages and made that into its own separate ragu and then had a little layer of rice and then another layer of the sausage and stuff ragu. The whole thing is really kind of up to whatever you feel like making. And in my opinion, this one is a good one, but this is just a classic Roman one. This is a, this is a kind of a Bacchanalian fest. How are the uh, Bacala things, huh? Very good. Yeah. Nice thing about a lot of Roman food, the Romans and the Tuscans are quite famous for their aggressive saltiness. And that's because in Italian culture, they would never simply drink without having something to eat. So they like salty food because it kind of gives them the opportunity to have maybe just one, one more glass of wine. <laughs> what the heck, just bring me one more martini, honey. So now we've got that in there and it's all right that it's hot because we're gonna bake it right now. If you weren't gonna cook this right now, you would wanna cool all of the ingredients to a refrigerator temperature first as we're all aware of in our food handlers class mm, there now, aren't we, Miss Caroline? <laughs> the trick being that if you know you're going to pop something right in the oven, then it doesn't really make a difference. So now we want to layer this on top. Mario, I'm yes. sorry, but the egg was in there to bind it together? Or? Yeah, so what's going to happen, if you didn't have the egg here, this would still make an interesting dish, but when you tried to cut it into cool, wedgy, kind of quiche-looking slices, it would just crumble and fall apart. And as a matter of fact, it's knowing that that ragu is such a thick layer in there, I'm starting to perhaps worry in the back of my mind, will this make me look as good as I want it to? And the way that I'm going to battle that, my thought process that takes me there, is that I'm going to make sure that I cover the top here, and then what I do to make sure that the rice has kind of infiltrated where the ragu might be in too thick of a portion, mm -hmm. I press down very aggressively. And what that does is make sure that between like where the ragu is kind of loose, I've pushed rice down into that. And that egg in there is going to set that. Egg, of course, helps set anything more because of the albumin or the white than because of the yolk or the protein. Then what we're going to do is we're going to dust the top with even more breadcrumbs and a touch of Pecorino Romano. We're going to toss it in a 450 degree oven for about 45 minutes. When we come back, I'll show you how you take this little puppy out. And I'm going to wear it like a crown. Hail Caesar. Welcome back. Well, now we've got our beautiful turban or timbalo. It's hot. The key is you want to run your knife around the outside edge just to make sure those breadcrumbs have done their appointed job. It smells delicious. It does smell delicious. Mm -hmm. The key, if this didn't come out looking like this at your house, what you would do is you would make sure that you turned on the broiler in the last couple of seconds, just to make sure that you get that nice toasty brown on top, because it makes a huge difference to have something that looks, I mean, 
White on rice is just no bueno. But having it nice golden brown, then what I would do just to mess things up is just drizzle a little bit of shiny, happy people going on. And then you just carve it like so. And you can feel that the rice is set. You can feel that there's a lot of love going on there. And then you pull out a wedge like that and hello. Welcome to Rome, ladies and gentlemen. First stop, Timbalo. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've been a heck of a lot of fun. Thank I want to thank you guys for being here, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mario.